Hello, Montana, and hello, world. This is Chris Islop from the Montana World Affairs Council with another episode of Connect Montana. This week, in partnership with our friends at Arts Missoula, we're bringing you Arts International, where we're looking at the very vibrant arts community of Montana and its many connections with the world and international issues. Yesterday, we had Monty Dolak, and today I'm extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Rafael Chacon, he is the Bruce and Suzanne Crocker Director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture and Professor of Art and History and Criticism in the School of Art at the University of Montana in Missoula. He holds an AB in Art from Wabash College and received MA and PhD degrees in Art History with honors from the University of Chicago. A specialist on Renaissance and Baroque Art, Dr. Chacon has taught a range of topical courses on art history and criticism at the University of Montana over the last 25 years. His academic research lies in American architectural history, historic preservation, and Montana history, including the history of its visual arts. He was named one of the Smithsonian's 10 lecturers in 2014. His newly found passion for vexillology, or the study of flags, won the Whitney Smith Award for the top 10 paper in 2019. You are very welcome, Raphael. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Montana World Affairs Council. It's, uh, it's great to be a part of Connect Montana, and hello, Montana and the world. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk with you a little bit about my life and my interest in things global, and in some ways, my uh, personal life and my professional life have intersected around international concerns, international issues. So in some ways, um, I'm honored to be a part of this program and uh, to share some of the things that I've experienced um, in my lifetime. So I am, as, uh, as Chris mentioned, I am the director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and I've been at this job for a little under two years. And it's a privilege. It really is um, a remarkable place to, uh, or platform, if you will, from which to share uh, the world. Um, and in fact, in some ways, what a museum does, the concept of the museum is, in fact, to share objects, first and foremost, but also programming and exhibitions and conversations and to allow the space for us to talk about the greater world. And that's really what the, what the museum, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture does. Um, it's, uh, we not only sit at the University of Montana campus, we're part of the, an integral part of the University of Montana, but we also belong to the state and the region, and in some ways we belong to the world. We have a collection that is global in focus, um, historically very, very rich and very, very old. And um, so as the director, I get to, to share that. And it really is, like I said earlier, it's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, exhibitions that in some ways open, uh, open the world to us in, uh, in Western and rural Montana. Um, for example, we're doing an exhibition uh, that opens uh, in, a few, in a few days in, on September 11th. Uh, this is an exhibition called Bookish and its selections from the Dan Weinberg collection. And this is a collection of books that were published in New York City by uh, Vincent Fitzgerald and company um, over a, a long span of time, at least uh, three decades. And this exhibition are tales from all over the world, great literature. And these books are special because they, they pair uh, works of art with, uh, with great works of literature, great writing. And so they are in some ways books, but they're more than books. They're actually in some cases pieces of sculpture and, and works of, of printmaking and all kinds of different media come together. And this is an exhibition that in some ways will open up um, the stories, the tales that are told all around the world for a long, long time. So I hope you get a chance to check that out. And then later in, um, in January, we will be uh, featuring two private collections of African art in, uh, in Western Montana. And, uh, and that'll be an, uh, an exhibition that we haven't seen, um, works of art that we haven't seen in a long, long time in this part of the world. And, and hopefully will remind us of the rich uh, and varied cultural traditions that the African continent has to offer. And uh, so I like to think that our museum in many ways addresses global concerns, global issues, not just um, the aesthetics from all around the world and across uh, time and, uh, and space. So I hope you can join us at some point and take part in, the, in that programming. So much of what I do is in fact to engage um, uh, international or global ideas. But as I mentioned earlier, 
in some ways, my whole life's uh, work has been uh, uh, has happened in a, in a kind of global context. I was born in Cuba, and I was born actually probably conceived during the uh, the uh, the missile crisis. So I was born in, into uh, into the Cold War, and so I I have not been spared as a Cuban American uh, growing up in this country. I've not been spared thinking about uh, geopolitics and geopolitical concerns my entire life. My family was a multilingual family. We spoke uh, two languages at home at, at times, and often more than that. And, uh, and it was a family that encouraged uh, a kind of dialogue with the greater world. Always uh, a conversation around politics, around culture, was, always took place around our dinner table. So in some ways, my life has been uh, very much colored by that. And of course, pursuing a career in art history meant that I was engaging the world's art directly. I, I think I remember uh, distinctly my very first uh, lecture in a survey, an art history survey class, and, and feeling burdened, intensely burdened by this idea of the imposter syndrome, that here I was trying to teach the world to a bunch of college freshmen at the University of Chicago. And, um, but what it, what it did for me is that in fact, it, it reminded me that in some ways I was well positioned to do that, uh, growing up in uh, having been born in another country, being an immigrant and a refugee to the United States, growing up in, in a very multicultural uh, context in Northwest Indiana and in South Chicago. I was in some ways positioned to talk about global things. And of course, art history, the, the world's art opens up the world to all of us. And it wasn't just simply art, it was also language. Um, we were encouraged to learn foreign languages as a child. My sister spoke French, I spoke German, and we picked up other languages along the way. And those languages really opened up the world to us. And it encouraged us to travel, which we did. We were a part of a generation that collected stamps and, uh, and had pen pals all around the world, and eventually uh, found ourselves uh, traveling, you know, backpacking around um, Europe and Africa and other parts of the world. And so I feel in some ways very privileged to have had that orientation as a kid, and then to find myself in a profession, art history, that in some ways demanded it. That if, uh, if you're going to teach the world's great traditions, its cultures, uh, the richness of its arts, then it's kind of vital that you do get out and see the world and certainly that you read about the world and that you stay on top of global politics and, uh, and things happening in, in, um, in globalization and global cultures. So in some ways, my life has been, uh, has been oriented in that direction ever since I was young. And certainly my professional life has sustained that, uh, that interest. Um, I think it, in some ways it's been, a, it's been a, a very much a life of privilege to be able to do that. And I think that, um, you know, Americans have a bad rap around the world as being insular. And that's partly true. Uh, but it's also true that Americans travel and that we, we have a presence around the world. We're known around the world. And so I try to encourage my students here at the University of Montana and the individuals I come into contact with that we need the world and the world needs us. And so I encourage people to travel as much as possible, to certainly stay engaged with the world, even if they can't actually take a Smithsonian trip, even if they can't actually um, you know, go trekking across uh, Northern Spain or wherever, um, that they stay engaged with the world because we need the world and the world needs us. So I think that, um, that it's, it's important for us to kind of keep, um, to keep world affairs, uh, certainly international, affairs close to home. And so I applaud my community. I applaud this, uh, this community in, in Montana in general, because the assumption here is that we are, because we're a large state with a small population, that we're somehow isolated from the world. And of course, that's far from true. And I think if we look around at our immediate vicinity, we see that we have cultural institutions and all kinds of, of uh, profit groups, nonprofit groups, organizations, businesses that are really engaged uh, directly with with the world, and 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 so I, you know, I applaud those efforts, and I hope that that my role in this community, and certainly my role as director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, will continue to foster that kind of uh, that kind of environment and that kind of discourse. Um, so. I think that there, uh, that for me, there are multiple tracks for doing that. There is, of course, uh, the academic track, which I'm a part of, and I've, I've been teaching at the University of Montana for 25 years. And it's important, of course, that we continue to teach courses that foster 
the dialogue and the discourse with, um, with the rest of the world. Certainly through the avenues of culture, through the avenues of literature, through the avenues of art history, things like that, um, courses like that, that, that keep our academic community engaged with, um, with a broader picture. Um, again, to fight the kind of insularity that comes natural with our rural place. Um, so there is, of course, that academic route. And then there's the fact that, um, that we really do need to get out there. And of course, that's difficult to say that, and I'm speaking in the height of a global pandemic, which has put, in, in so many ways, has put the kibosh on, um, on travel. Uh, but I think that we have to think and aspire to reclaim that opportunity and that possibility. I, um, I lecture for the Smithsonian Institution, and I do that fairly regularly, uh, a couple times a year. And I've been doing that now for a long time, um, for almost a decade. Um, the Smithsonian is an amazing institution that has always had a kind of global orientation from, from its infancy forward. And the people who travel with the Smithsonian are in some ways invested in the world. A lot of, of course, given the demographic of people who go on these kinds of trips, you're talking about people who've had experiences in the world. Many of them were, uh, have worked in the, foreign, in the foreign service, have been, you know, have been engaged in the military, have had lives outside, outside the United States. But oftentimes it's just people who take an interest, an avid interest in knowing the world. And I think that, that the Smithsonian has been an, an amazing opportunity for me to see this incredible cross-section of people who love to travel. And um, I hope that the day comes when we can actually reclaim that capacity to, uh, to travel, to meet our neighbors, to, to speak freely with, our, with the world around us, because um, we need each other. Uh, I mean, we are part of a, in some ways, a shrinking world. And it's, um, and it's vital that if we really want to understand the world that we get out there again. And I think that day will, of course, will come. Um, and in the meantime, we'll just be a little bit patient. So I kind of want to wrap up my, uh, my conversation here by talking a little bit about vexillology uh, and flags and this kind of newfound interest. And I have to admit, it's, it may sound like it's a new interest for me, but I think I've been interested in flags for a long time, uh, almost as long as I've been interested in stamps. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, so this is a childhood passion of mine, uh, this idea of flags. It's only been in the last five years that I've actually made a foray into the professional side of this discipline, and that's the field of vexillology. And by the way, the term vexillology, which I think might be unfamiliar to a lot of people, derives from the, word, from the Latin word vexillum, which means flag. And so vexillology is the study of flags, of vexilla. And there is a, there is a, a, a uh, there is a sister field to vexillology, and it's called vexillography. And that is the design of flags. And I don't know if you've been tracking um, the kind of the buzz around the new Mississippi state flag and about new flags around the, the country and the dropping of flags, um, certainly the, the Confederate battle, uh, battle standard um, around the state or around the country. But flags are, in fact, important to us. And they are parts of our visual language, our visual uh, portfolio, if you will. Um, we don't think of flags, we tend to think of, we just think of them as just important symbols, yes, but mere symbols. And of course, today we are aware of how potent visual imagery is and how, um, how potent symbols can be um, because they're not just simple um, markers of institutions and organizations and states and things like that. People take these symbols very, very personally. They represent their beliefs, their values, and sometimes their ideologies. So flags, to me, are, are very important parts of our visual culture. So as an art historian, I started moving into the, the uh, pursuing the interest in flags, taking them seriously, and then lo and behold, I found that there were indeed lots of professionals out there uh, globally who take um, this set of visual material uh, quite seriously. And so it's kind of a pleasure to join the, the crew of vexillologists who, who study the history of flags, the design of flags, the impact that flags have around our world. So if you have any questions surrounding vexillology, I'd be more than happy to talk flag with you today. <laughs>
So um, I think we're now at uh, close to, uh, to the witching hour. So I will pass the, the torch back to Chris and, uh, and we'll take some questions from our uh, audience this morning. Rafael, thank you so much for that. that that's incredibly interesting. Um, and I appreciate the kind of very wide range looking both at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture and your own experience internationally and how that's kind of translated um, into your life and your work. And vexillology, I mean, you don't often get a chance to say that word. And, and so I'm, I'm happy that we have a chance. I'm gonna pick up on that. But before I do, there's um, an, always um, more questions than there is time. So I'm gonna uh, just ask a few questions, both from myself, Raphael, and things that are coming in from our participants. The first one is, is really from me. You know, you, you mentioned this thing about uh, Americans and how sometimes maybe we don't see ourselves as international but in fact, we're just as international as anybody else in the world. We are a part of this um, you know, international community um, and, and we are affected by international um, you know, th things that go on around us, of course. So um, my question is, um, you, you mentioned that we need, th the world needs us and we need the world. Why is that, Rafael? Could you expand uh, from your perspective, why does the world need us? Well, I, I think that, you know, in some ways that, that question could be answered by um, any number of political scientists, people who see the, the U.S. as a global power. I mean, we are an economic and, uh, and political and military force around the world. Um, but we like to think of ourselves as also a cultural beacon, as a moral power as well that we have uh, that the, the, the power of the myth of America, and that is that you know, we are a democracy, an open society, a society that, um, that believes in civil rights, in global rights, in, in the rights of the individual, the rights of humanity, and that stands for that. That message, I think, is important for the world to hear and to hear it constantly. And we can broadcast that, we can speak that language, we can print that message, um, or we can actually live that message. And I think actually engaging with the world, meeting people, talking with people, staying in people's homes, uh, frequenting their spaces, understanding their conditions, sharing our notions of democracy and sharing what, what an open society looks like, that is in fact, I think, what we have to offer the world and why the world in some ways needs us. If we drop that torch, then I think the world is really in a, in a, in a, in a dire predicament. Um, if we become provincial and isolated and so nationalistic that we don't think of ourselves as one species, one humanity, one, uh, one world, um, I think we'll all suffer in the end. So, there's, uh, so I believe that the, we still have a role to play. We have a great role to play and one that we should play with, um, uh, that we should play with, with zeal. And, and desire and to embrace the world, I think is something that is inherently very American. I mean, I understand too, that our origins speak otherwise. Our origins would say, well, you know, we separated from the world. We separated from a global power and empire. We wanted to in fact, keep to ourselves here. But I think that, that the rest of our history shows that we can be a really great force for good in the world. And so let's exercise that, that role. Thanks for that, uh, Rafael. I'm going to go over to Tom Benson, our friend and partner from Arts Missoula. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Rafael. I, I always enjoy hearing you speak, Rafael, because you're both knowledgeable and inspirational. So uh, it's, it's great to see you. Uh, um, and I don't have a question about vexillology other than the pronunciation. Um, <laughs> but I do have a question about um, uh, the, Mon uh, the uh, Montana Museum of Art and Culture. And, um, you know, for years, it's, it's been the, um, uh, it's, it's one of the largest, am I right? If not the largest, it's one of the largest collections of, of uh, art in the Northwest. Is that correct? It's one of the largest collections of art in the Northwest. Right. It's certainly the largest collection of art in the state of Montana, and maybe even the okay. richest collection. And, 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 and it's one of those collections that, you know, sadly, most of us haven't seen m m most of it because it's, it's, it's all, you know, hidden away. And, 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 um, and, and of course, with the COVID pandemic, 
uh, we've all been we've all been uh, hit really hard with this, particularly the arts, and um, um, and yet uh, we're we're resilient as as human beings, and and there will be. I mean, um, uh, what what are what are the what is your vision or the plans for for the museum when we come out on the other side? How are you you know kind of position yourself both regionally and and internationally uh, when when we get through all this? Thank you, Tom. I, I appreciate your question. Uh, yeah, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture is one of three state museums. Um, it is, in fact, the largest and richest collection of, uh, of art in the state of Montana. And unfortunately, for the last 125 years, we haven't had a permanent home. And so much of the collection, as you say, is, is in fact, stored away. And we can only exhibit a very small percentage of it at a time. Our vision here is to, in fact, give it a new home. And that's we've, we've, uh, we've set on that path. Uh, and we're making headway into that uh, into that path. Um, I wish you could see the plans for for the the new building that we're cooking up, and I wish that I could share some of those things with you. Uh, but that's that you know you you will be seeing in, uh, news about that in uh, in in, a sh in short order. Um, we have a, a a new location on the university campus, which is very exciting to us. Uh, but it's a it's a location that in some ways will uh, will bridge us to the community in a better way. And, and will make the, this collection much more accessible than it has been, certainly. So, um, so lots of good news in, in the works. Uh, so keep, keep your eyes peeled. And by the way, you pronounce vexillology perfectly. <laughs> I think the more you roll that word off your tongue, the more comfortable yeah. you'll be with the concept. Vexillology. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for, Absolutely. Thanks for practice, your question. Practice yeah, makes perfect, you. for sure, on that one, Rafael. Um, uh, another question, Rafael, you mentioned your upcoming exhibition, Bookish, which is going to pair works of art with literature. Could I put it to you to please pair um, art uh, writ large, and you, you mentioned kind of geopolitics or international current events. How can art help us understand and appreciate the events that are going on around us? Um, I think art is, I've always, I've always believed that art is a kind of hub. It's a place where humanity finds itself, um, puts its values, organizes its ideas. Um, sometimes it's, a pl it's the locus of our frustrations, our problems, our concerns, our sadnesses even. The work of art is, is this remarkable, has a remarkable capacity to bring people together. And of course, I'm not talking about the uh, artwork that is collaborative, which inherently pulls together various people uh, into, uh, into itself. I'm talking about all works of art. People reveal themselves. They say things about their culture. They share their values. And they place them into these things we call art objects. So the work of art is inherently connected to our, the stories we tell, to what we think about ourselves. So I think of, of, of works of art, and, and, I, and I'm speaking um, about art in a kind of, um, in a cosmopolitan sense. I'm talking about literature, I'm talking about opera, I'm talking about music, I'm talking about all of the arts. The arts are a way for us to talk to each other and to pass on values from one generation to the next. And most importantly, it's, it's a place that brings us together. So, a museum draws you to these works of art, but those works of art, once you see them, take you out beyond yourself, beyond your own, you know, your own bubble. And, and, and so I think that works of art have powerful, powerful ways of connecting. I was just, uh, I'm, I'm so happy that you had a chance to do this, that to bring uh, Monty Dolak to connect Montana, because here is an individual who is, who is a global thinker and his art is all over the world. I mean, I, the last time I ran into a Monty Dolak overseas was in a bar in Berlin, there was a Monty Dolak poster. And of course we know that his imagery are on the sides of buses in Japan. So, um, so Monty is, M Monty's an exceptional human being, yes, but he also understands the power of art to connect us, to bring us together. People in Japan know about Missoula, Montana because they've seen Monty Dolak's art on the side of their municipal buses. So that is, uh, that's a remarkable thing. It's a powerful, powerful tool for connection. 
Yeah, Raphael, um, as you know, Monty was on yesterday and he, he very eloquently made that case as well. And he referenced the, the Berlin and um, not only that, but a small mountain hut in Nepal had one of his posters uh, at one time. So yeah, he's all over the world and with a great appreciation of what that means, really. It's, it's not just that it's interesting that one of his things appears, but it, it also goes beyond that, as you say, um, in, in terms of the of connections. Um, we've got time for one more question. Here's something from one of our participants. Finally, on to vexillology. Which flags are you currently studying or interested in studying? Ah, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, uh, I have a couple of different research projects and flags right now. Um, some of them pretty obscure and some of them more, more sort of populist. Uh, um, I'm certainly tracking the, uh, the new state flags, and, uh, and I think that um, as states reckon with their histories um, and they start uh, exercising the option to change their flags, I, I, you know, I'm fascinated by the kind of the debates around that. How do we choose a flag that is appropriate to our time? And, and how, do we, how do we relinquish our loyalties to images that have, have served us for a long time but no longer serve us? Practically, or even offend certain or you know certain parts of the population. So that is a, a, a truly uh, an important uh, interest to me. Um, I'm certainly interested in the Montana state flag. I don't think it's and I think it's no no uh, no secret that I don't think it's a very good flag. And and the reason I say that is it, it is not to offend people who are very very loyal to our state flag, but it's to say that it's a very formulaic flag that is very from the perspective of art it's actually quite uninspiring. Um, it is, it's a formula flag, and there are many, many states that have these formula flags. They all look alike. If you saw them from a distance, they would all look like the same flag. And I would love to see Montanans embrace a flag that is distinctive for our state, because our state is distinctive. I wish we had a flag that represented us much better than the one that we have. And so I, I kind of want to challenge people to look at that flag and ask themselves why it works and why it doesn't work, uh, more importantly. And if we were to change it, how would we change it? How would we, in fact, what kind of an image would we draw that any school child would recognize as our flag, our state flag, and would recognize, would see themselves in that flag? And so that's the kind of the project that always keeps me thinking at, at, uh, late at night when I think f about flags. Uh, outstanding. Well, well, Rafael, we've covered a lot of ground here today, which always makes for a good show. So I want to say thank you again for coming on, sharing a little bit of your professional world, a little bit of your personal world, and um, you know what it means to you and what it means for us to engage in the world. So I'm just going to go back to you if there's anything uh, finally you would like to say to our participants. I would just say give the world a nice big virtual hug <laughs> because we need hugs more than ever. Thank you, Chris. It's been a, it's been a delight. Raphael can't thank you enough. Um, and also thanks uh, yesterday to Monty Dolak. Tomorrow, you don't want to miss this one. It's at noon, so get your lunch ready, open your computer, because Terry Elander from the Missoula Children's Theater is going to join us and talk about this extraordinary community resource that reaches all around the world. And I am going to share a story about my wife living in Opine, Montana, and having the Missoula Children's Theater come through when she was a, uh, in second grade. So you don't want to miss that. Let me just say again that if this kind of thing interests you, if you like to be engaged in the world, if you like to see how things like art connect to global, uh, global policy, um, topics that are happening today, join us on Connect Montana, but more importantly, join the Montana World Affairs Council. We're a small, um, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization whose only goal is to bring to Montana's communities and schools engagement in international topics and international issues. So you can see right over my shoulder here, www.montanaworldaffairs.org. Come visit our website. Uh, and uh, if you're really interested, support us. I would really appreciate it. So again, tomorrow is Terry Elander's coming up. In the next weeks, Connect Montana has a uh, incredible palette of interesting things coming up. We've got a series on disinformation, misinformation, and fake news with international experts on those topics coming in on the tech side, on the media side. We're going to have an international healthcare series 
um, explaining a little bit more about what does healthcare look like around the world. We also have a series um, coming up on elections. This isn't US domestic elections, but this is how does the world do elections? What role do multilaterals like the United Nations and the Office for Security and Coordination in Europe, what do they do uh, when they have an election and when they have to manage elections? So a huge number of very interesting shows coming up. I hope you can all join us. So until then, thank you all. Raphael, thank you again. Uh, everybody be well. Hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.